Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. In 1962, when President John F. Kennedy received an honorary degree from Yale, he noted, quote, it might be said that I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree, unquote. Today's speaker, Martha Minow, holds her undergraduate degree from Michigan and her law degree from Yale. Now, lest you think, especially you Ohioans, that she has missed out on utopia, Dr. Minow has rehabilitated herself and uh, earned a master's in education from Harvard and has taught on the Harvard Law School faculty for 30 years and since 2009 has served as dean of the Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School holds a unique position of excellence and leadership in our country and in the world. The President of the United States went to Harvard Law, as did six of the nine sitting justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, as have countless leaders uh, of our society uh, and, and our world. And don't forget uh, L. Woods. Of, uh, <laughs> for you, those of you who saw Legally Blonde, she went to Harvard as well. And Dean Minow is a remarkably accomplished leader of this unique institution. Before joining the Harvard Law faculty, Dean Minow clerked for Judge David Bazelon on the U.S. Circuit Court, uh, then for Justice Thurgood Marshall on the U.S. US uh, Supreme Court. Dean Minow is a senior fellow of the Harvard Society of Fellows and is also the Jeremiah Smith, Jr. Professor of Law. She has taught at Harvard Law School since 1981, focusing in the areas of, deep breath here, civil procedure, constitutional law, family law, international criminal justice, jurisprudence, law and education, uh, nonprofit organizations, public law, privatization, military justice, uh, and ethnic and religious conflict. Dean Minow is an expert on human rights and advocacy for members of racial and religious minorities and for women, children, and persons with disabilities. Dean Minow has been extensively honored by various national organizations, uh, and it is telling that she's been extensively honored by her students at Harvard. She sits on numerous not-for-profit boards and is uh, vice chair of the Legal Services Corporation. In the legal world and the larger world, Dean Minow is truly a force of nature. Please welcome Dean Martha Minow. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Uh, thank you, Jim. It is such a pleasure and privilege to be here it, with the City Club of Cleveland, the Citadel of Free Speech, as you head into your 100th uh, anniversary. And I'd like to say that I'm part of the gala celebration, although I may have jumped the gun a couple of months. Your mission is so admirable and so well stated that I may steal it. I particularly like uh, the emphasis on dialogue in a collegial setting. And just to, if I could just insert a little law there, I might just take it back home to Harvard Law School. One of my favorite cartoons shows a man uh, at the beach talking into a seashell. Sitting by him are two women talking to each other saying, yeah, he never was that good a listener. <laughs> it actually would be much more meaningful to me to jump immediately to the question and answer period because I really want to learn from you. But I promise I will give you something to provoke uh, the discussion. I'm especially glad uh, to be here today as a professor rather than as dean uh, and ha have the chance to talk with you about something I've been passionate about for some time. I published a book this past fall that looks at the legacies of Brown versus Board of Education, probably the most famous decision of the United States Supreme Court, controversial in some quarters when it was decided in 1954, the decision is also celebrated as a symbol around the world, as a symbol of equal justice in particular. Explicitly rejecting state-mandated racial segregation, this decision established equality as the central commitment for American schooling. But it has also launched over a half a century of debate about whether that equality requires teaching together in the same room students from different backgrounds or instead allowing or even requiring separation along various lines of division. 
When groups around the country gathered to mark the 50th anniversary of this important decision in 2004, I confess I was saddened and frustrated by how much of the attention emphasized disappointment and critique. Since then, it's become only more sharply evident that racial integration, per se, is neither required by the law nor is it being accomplished around this country. You've seen this in Cleveland. It's true around the country. The United States Supreme Court itself has even rejected modest, voluntary efforts to produce racially mixed schools. Schools, in fact, now are more racially separated today uh, than they were in 1954. Though now it's by choices about where people live, uh, where people can afford to live, and not by state-mandated rules. Talk of Brown as a failure, though, seems to me unfair. And uh, also worrisome are questions about whether the lawyers who were involved in the case actually undermined rather than enhanced social change and social justice. So I decided to investigate for the book I just published uh, what actually, actually are the legacies of this important decision. And I'll summarize uh, very quickly that there has been a positive impact uh, even on the area of racial justice, it's undeniable, but the punchline of my talk, so if you need to, you can go to sleep right now, uh, is that the impact has probably been even greater outside of the context of race. So when it comes to racial justice, Brown may have been more important as a symbol outside of schools. When it comes to schools, Brown may be more important for its impact on gender, disability, language, many other aspects of student identity. So that's the headline. Let's, uh, let's talk. I'm especially interested to hear your perspectives, mindful of Cleveland's vital site in key desegregation issues and also in the school choice uh, debates. So as a hint of Brown's remarkable impact, let me quote from you from part of the argument of the lawyer who defended racial segregation in the Brown case before the United States Supreme Court. This is John Davis representing South Carolina, and he said, May it please the court, I think if appellant's construction of the 14th Amendment should prevail here, there is no doubt in my mind that it would catch the Indian within its grasp just as much as the Negro. Should it prevail, I am unable to see why a state would have any further right to segregate its pupils on the ground of sex, or on the ground of age, or on the ground of mental capacity. Turns out, he was right. Brown set in motion processes of change that have indeed extended the claims of equality regardless of gender, disability, other immutable markers of identity. There's no debate now in this country that equal educational opportunity is a constitutional right. There is a debate about what does that mean? What does it take? What does it require? So first, let me just turn to the status of race in American schools. And it's a, it's a complicated uh, and, and not entirely encouraging story. Dismantling the state rules mandating separation by race, that's the accomplishment of Brown. But the current situation in schools reflects residential patterns. Of the 5,300 uh, 5, communities in this country with fewer than 100,000 people, at least 90% of those uh, people living in those smaller communities are white. That means that the schools in those communities are predominantly white. We're talking here largely about suburbs. White families with options avoid racially mixed schools by moving to white communities. Large urban districts in which 70% of students are non-white and over half are poor or near poor face higher levels of violence, disruption, dropouts, lower test scores than do suburban schools. That's the divide in America. It's as much about class as it is about race, but it absolutely has a racial dimension. Brown rejected legally enforced racial separation of students. And it discussed the crucial importance of racial integration of students, but it did not mandate it. Indeed, the Supreme Court's opinion had three crucial elements. And I will quote, First, in these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education, such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it as a right that must be available to all on equal terms. Second, to separate black children from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race 
generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community. And finally, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. So as you can see, clearly mandated separation was outlawed, but the court was also concerned about the psychological experience and about the actual opportunities to be educated side by side with people from different backgrounds. It has become less clear that the latter is actually a goal. It's unclear whether equal opportunity demands more than simply ending the official assignment of students based on race to different schools, and also requires something more affirmative, bringing together students from uh, different backgrounds. Now, we do know, of course, that opposition to this dimension, integration, has deep roots. Only 15 months after the decision in Brown, a group of white men brutally lynched 14-year-old Emmett Till in Mississippi, and an all-white jury acquitted the men prosecuted for that murder. The incident exposed the strict code of racial subordination that was enforced by vigilante violence and a corrupt legal system. And in fact, that was one of many events that sparked the grassroots movements for still unrealized civil rights for all. Against that backdrop and other violent incidents, school desegregation stalled in the South in the 1950s. Resistance took the form of delay, violence, and subterfuge. Virginia cut off funding for public schooling rather than have integration, just as a sign of one of the kinds of oppositions. Although that was the most extreme form of resistance, federal courts also delayed serious enforcement in the face of resistance, and the Supreme Court had left enforcement to the local courts. Ninety-six U.S. Senators and Representatives uh, uh, developed a statement opposing integration uh, in the 1950s, and it wasn't until 58 that the court itself turned the corner when it unanimously rejected state resistance to a desegregation plan in Little Rock, Arkansas, and President Eisenhower actually called out the National Guard to enforce it. Until 1964, though, integrated schooling reached only one out of 85 black students in the southern states that had joined the Confederacy during the Civil War. One reporter at the time noted the irony. Southern white legislators who opposed integration declared you can't legislate human relations at the very moment they were legislating and banning people from joining together uh, across the racial line in sports, music, eating, talking, playing cards against the law. So you can't mandate social relations, and yet, of course, that's what the law was doing. At the same time, eliminating those racial uh, restrictions has not uh, produced integration. Um, we do have the wonderful legacy of Martin Luther King and grassroots advocates who brought uh, a march to Washington, helped to fuel the 1964 Civil Rights Act, propelled in part by sympathy for the slain President John F. Kennedy uh, and the masterful skills of President Lyndon Johnson. And it is the 1964 Civil Rights Act that energized the civil rights movement, led to federal enforcement, four new appointments to the Supreme Court between 1961 and 67, led to a big change in the court. In 1968, the court rejected, relevant to our school choice question, a freedom of choice plan because no white student elected to join uh, any school that had been historically a black school. Interestingly, the peak of enforcement for school desegregation in this country occurred under the leadership of President Richard Nixon. He and his staff organized biracial, uh, multiracial leaders in seven key southern states to plan for peaceful and orderly implementation. Uh, and uh, under his uh, leadership, at least initially, the uh, escalation of integration proceeded by uh, the 1971. Uh, a majority of those southern states actually had uh, de desegregated their schools and integrated them. And notably, black high school graduation rates escalated. Performance of black students on tests, on standardized tests, uh, grew to uh, approximate the performance of white students. And interestingly, during this exact period, the achievement levels of white students also increased. But this high watermark was short-lived. A majority of white people told opinion pollsters that the Johnson administration pursued civil rights too aggressively, and that reaction grew uh, over time. In Boston, 
Uh, as I know from firsthand, the protests turned violent. This occurred uh, in many parts of the country. And in 1974, reflecting some changes in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court actually decided to confine desegregation orders to the borders of the district in which segregated schooling had occurred. This meant that Detroit could not include the suburbs in their desegregation plan. It also meant that white families interested in avoiding desegregation had only to leave the cities and go to the suburbs. And that has been the history ever since. That history, I think, helps to explain why many people describe this current moment as one of resegregation. And I, I have to acknowledge that integration has not been achieved in American schools. But it's wrong to call it resegregation if that is meant to, in any way, suggest that these are official actions. The government is not ordering it. Unfortunately, these are legacies of attitudes in communities, as well as a representation of the continuing income gap in America. Here is the neglected story, to which I devote much of my book. Brown, in the meantime, meaning both the decision in the court and the social movement surrounding it, stimulated advocates and reform activity tackling exclusions and inequality in schools along the lines of language, ethnicity, immigration status, gender, disability, as well as the status of American Indians, Native Hawaiians, poverty, religion. And one of the major re uh, changes here now is that every, every child in America, citizen or not, girl or boy, disabled or not, has a right to an equal opportunity in education, at least as a matter of law. There's a continuing debate in almost all of these areas whether that equality calls for mixing students who are different or instead can or should be achieved through homogeneous classrooms. But the ideal of equality has been now so well established in each of these areas, and I will review each one briefly because I don't have much time left. Take, for example, language. Uh, at the time of Brown, there was no idea that students who didn't speak English had any particular rights in schools, and indeed, most didn't uh, go to public school or didn't stay. But in 1974, the Supreme Court of the United States, in a case inspired by Brown, decided that, in fact, students who didn't speak English had a right to some kind of educational program that would assure them equal access to education. That was the birth of the bilingual education movement, while that continues to be controversial, and there are debates about whether to pull kids out in separate classrooms or instead have mainstreaming and structured immersion, there's no question now, but there's a right to a full and adequate opportunity to learn, even for students who don't come into the school speaking English. Same could be said for students who are not citizens. Supreme Court of the United States decided that a non-citizen cannot be excluded from the public schools. That's a, a decision uh, that has continued to have great importance in many communities. Uh, and it, we will watch what happens uh, with ongoing immigration reform. But it's one reason why schools, I think, are so reluctant to be drawn into the business of reporting who's undocumented. In addition, we have new interesting challenges as many communities have created newcomer schools with the idea that it's easier for immigrants, particularly in the high school years, to go to a school with people like themselves. Does this raise new questions of segregation? I think these are important questions, but they, they are clearly motivated by the desire to have a kind of crash course in English and help kids make it in America. Take gender. Historically, in the world, to the extent that there was any educational opportunity for girls, it was always done either separately from boys or at a lower level of quality. Not so true in the United States, except for the most elite forms of education, but largely because of money. When common schooling started in America, the arguments were for segregating girls and boys, and yet there wasn't enough money. And so the schools were co-ed from the start, except the elite schools. So take, for example, Philadelphia. The most elite school there is called Central High, and historically, it was open only to boys. There's also a girls' school called Girls High. Get it? Central High, Girls High. Get it? Well, there was a, a, there was a young girl, uh, Susan Borchheimer, who wanted to go to Central High. It had a better uh, curriculum, better faculty. She challenged the exclusion. She won in court. 
She won in the district court. She, won in the co uh, she lost in the Court of Appeals, unfortunately. And then the Supreme Court deci des des uh, decided to grant the case, and one of the justices was away. They divided four to four. And to this day, that decision, the Vorchheimer case, is the law of the land. There is no right to co-education under federal law in this country. Nonetheless, uh, the Supreme Court has gone on to decide that the uh, Mississippi University for Women cannot exclude men. And uh, in addition, uh, the Virginia Military Institute cannot exclude women. So there are some uh, developments along those lines. And inspired by that, uh, the uh, Central High in Philadelphia has been challenged under state law, and now it is co-educational under state law. Interestingly, Girls High is still all girls. <laughs> there have been arguments, new ones, for single-sex education. This has been a, a priority, in fact. Um, of President George W. Bush, uh, and under his leadership, the Department of Education developed a rule to promote single-sex instruction. Um, and there are, I know there's a single-sex school here. Um, there's a growth of these schools. Interestingly, in 1996, the same year that the Supreme Court decided that Virginia Military Institute cannot exclude women, what was the founding of the Young Women's Leadership School in East Harlem, New York, which has become a flagship of a development of a whole new group of single-sex schools, public schools all around the, the country. So there's some ambivalence about this, whether quality education is uh, better delivered in single-sex form or in co-ed form. This is for clear, though, uh, as a great transformation. It's all focused on what will provide the best opportunity for the students, which was not the, not the case in 1974. My own view about this, uh, but I'd be happy to talk with you about questions and answers about this, is that Justice Ginsburg had it pretty right uh, in 1996 when she wrote the opinion in the Virginia Military Institute case that the question here isn't about whether gender is being used, it's instead what the justification is. And if the justification is based on generalizations and stereotypes, that's not adequate. There has to be a persuasive rationale. And therefore, when Louisiana recently proposed a middle schools uh, that were single sex based on the view that boys are hunters and girls are mothers, the American Civil Liberties Union threatened a suit, and that particular initiative has halted. Um, Disability is another area where the legacy of Brown is absolutely extraordinary. Throughout American history, as is indeed true in many parts of the world, children with mental and physical disabilities were excluded from schools or put in separate schools, that, uh, separate uh, instruction that did not give them the access to the same curriculum as others. Lawsuits were brought by advocates in the 60s and 70s, explicitly modeled on Brown versus Board of Education to challenge that practice. The first uh, suit in 1969, the court explicitly borrowed the language from Brown and said that se separate is not equal here. And that, uh, in turn, led to a few more suits and then to landmark federal legislation, now called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that requires the instruction of students uh, with their uh, disabilities, whether it's mental or physical disabilities, in the least restrictive environment, and assuring them a free and appropriate public education. That is a transformation. There continues to be debates about whether separate instruction or integrated instruction makes the most sense, depending on the student's uh, disability. Um, and uh, there are interesting developments even in the school choice business. One of the fastest growing areas of school choice actually is charter schools or, or vouchers for kids uh, with autism or kids with learning disabilities. Um, so th it's an interesting question, but I can say that before the adoption of the federal law, um, most students with disabilities who received any education spent most of their time in school settings apart from students without disabilities. Now the numbers are completely reversed. Over 70% of students with disabilities spend at least part of their day in a regular classroom with other students. Another fascinating area where Brown has had uh, a big impact uh, is American Indians. Remember John Davis said, if Brown goes the way that Thurgood Marshall wants, what happens to American Indians? Well, the answer is they get rights. Um, and there have been some uh, developments there that include financial assistance 
uh, as well as access to uh, many kinds of schools. Most recently and most successfully, the creation of a series of community colleges that are run by American Indians and have a much higher uh, percentage of graduation uh, than uh, the experience that Native American students have at other schools. Same for Native Hawaiians, and I'd love to tell you about that. Anybody wants to hear about it, I'm skipping ahead, but it's a great story. One more amazing consequence um, is in the context of religion. This might be the most surprising application of Brown versus Board of Education but quite explicitly copying Brown versus Board of Education. Two groups of people came together to challenge rules in, uh, established by the Supreme Court that forbade the use of any public dollars to support religious schools. One group of people uh, were those who actually support religious education uh, and had tried through the years to have tax tuition credits and other kinds of devices and failed. Um, and uh, with the leadership of individuals like Michael McConnell, uh, who was a legal scholar, then a federal judge, now a law professor again, came up with the idea of recasting the question from the Establishment Clause, borrowing any kind of uh, public dollars to, public, uh, uh, to, to religious schools, to instead approach it as a matter of equal treatment, neutrality, and also viewpoint discrimination. The other group of students were very interested in enhancing educational opportunity, particularly for poor students of color. And in many urban areas, certainly true in my hometown of Chicago, one of the best options is parochial schools. Uh, and these two groups of people came together, and uh, a case coming from Cleveland ended up being the landmark case in which the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that, in fact, private vouchers with uh, use by religious schools can be part of a school choice scheme where the goal is to enhance equal educational opportunity. I'd be really interested to hear your views about how's that working. It's part of a much larger movement of school choice, which itself shows the paradoxical and surprising legacies of Brown. School choice at the beginning of Brown versus Board of Education was a device to avoid desegregation. Remember, the Supreme Court rejected it in 1968. It became, over time, one of the ways to actually attract students voluntarily to go to schools where they crossed over racial lines. That was true in Boston. And over time, school choice, including charter schools, pilot schools, magnet schools, and vouchers, has become one of the chief vehicles for improving the quality of instruction. I'll just plant a question mark for you here. Is integration across lines of race, religion, class, one of the goals of school choice? And if so, how do you ensure that? Or does school choice actually create a much easier way for people to have separation and self-separation? And by that, I, I just want to underscore, you could have uh, schools that are part of a school choice scheme that had as a goal to integrate students by having uh, topics like science or music, or you could have school choice that has as a goal to have Afrocentric schools or schools that are Arabic language schools that actually lead to more separation. And the jury's out on that one. I will close by noting one more surprising legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. And that is outside the United States. So I found it utterly fascinating to trace the influence to Eastern Europe where in a landmark lawsuit modeled explicitly on the grounds of Brown versus Board of Education with the advice of one of the original lawyers involved in that case, Jack Greenberg, the European Court of Human Rights tackled a practice by which Roma students, sometimes called gypsies, have been systematically excluded from the mainstream schools in the Czech Republic. The device here was not something like uh, explicit segregation. It instead used the administration of intelligence tests that were conveniently given in the Czech language, which was not spoken by most of the Roma children. So surprise, surprise, most of them did not do so well on those tests, and they ended up being assigned to schools for students with mental disabilities. The challenge to that practice succeeded in this European Court of Human Rights, it's been a challenge to implement it, but it is a landmark case. Another example is in South Africa, 
where Brown versus Board of Education has been cited repeatedly by the Constitutional Court there since the end of apartheid, and most recently was an influence in a case challenging the uh, treatment of English-speaking students, all black South Africans, in a region in which there were spaces in the Afrikaans language school, but the school did not offer English instruction. And there were no adequate spaces for the students who spoke English in any other school. While the Constitution of South Africa recognizes language rights, the court, in a very deft and delicate judgment, says that, yes, protecting the right to instruct students in Afrikaans has to be preserved. However, the dwindling number of students who want that instruction means that there's now space in these schools, and it must be made open for students who prefer English as the medium of instruction. Finally, Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has a tradition of two school systems, one that's government-run with Protestant roots, serves about half the students, the other that's Catholic-run, and uh, it serves the rest of the students. A movement for integrated schooling started in the 1980s and has a small amount of public support. But the government support is contingent upon showing that there are actual wait lists of people interested in integrated schooling. And this actually has succeeded, at least in generating that desire. By 2009, there are now 20 uh, nursery schools that are integrated, 40 uh, integrated primary schools, uh, 20 uh, integrated uh, second level schools. It barely reaches 5% of the population, but most notably, 82% of the polled community report that they personally support the idea of integrated schooling. And most of the parents say their only reason their children do not attend an integrated school is because they cannot get into one. Kind of an interesting alternative story. What if we had made integrated schooling a scarce commodity? Might we have developed an appetite for it? I want to close simply by saying that the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education is as much the inspiring example of the advocates who worked both before the case and after the case for its implementation. Those advocates inspired the development of the reforms I've described in all of these other areas. And it's interesting to see that in court, Brown has been cited for many other important insights. It's germane to the treatment of gender in calculating pension benefits, to the duty of state officials to obey the Constitution in dealing with extraditing criminals, to children's rights, to voting redistricting. It has developed a kind of iconic status, a touchstone for what is moral progress. When President George W. Bush uh, opposed race-conscious college admission practices, he cited Brown versus Board of Education. It is the touchstone, whatever your view is on a particular matter. And as the superintendent of the National Historic Site for Brown versus Board of Education, Steve Adams said, Brown belongs not to the United States, but to the world. I look forward to your questions and comments. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Martha Minow, Dean of the Harvard Law School. We will return to our speaker in a minute for the traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to go ahead and formulate your questions now and remember to please keep them brief. The City Club of Cleveland, as has been mentioned, will celebrate our 100th uh, birthday in 2012 and festivities are already underway and being planned uh, as we prepare for this, we hope that you'll join us in the celebration of our 100th year. We also hope that you'll support us financially to help secure the next 100 years of civil and civic discourse. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. We're pleased to welcome guests today at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler, Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, and Squire Sanders. Thank you all for joining us today. 
Now we'd like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everybody, including guests, and uh, maybe the dean, given your great Socratic method, you'll call on some of the <laughs> Harvard Law alums here today. Holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director Carrie Miller. First question, please. law reviews of the United States. Recently, Chief Justice Roberts denigrated academics' writings as having little practical value in the administration of justice or the practice of law. Would you please comment? Thank you for the question. So, um, Chief Justice John Roberts actually was my co-clerk, uh, and we we recently hosted him uh, in our moot court, and uh, he is a friend. Uh, I welcome uh, friendly criticism of the sort that he's offered. I, I don't think he's wrong. I think that uh, if you look at the citation rate uh, in uh, judicial opinions and other uh, professional materials, there's a declining rate of references to academic journals. Um, I, there is, in fact, a very interesting development going on in law schools, which is as there's a greater outreach to disciplines like economics, psychology, and philosophy, there can be a greater gulf with the uh, field of actual practice. That said, um, I, I actually do want to point out that we now at Harvard have 17 journals, many of which are far more uh, devoted to being relevant to practitioners than the Harvard Law Review. Um, although I, I would like to actually commend the Harvard Law Review itself, which has done, I think, a superb job in addressing uh, each year a review of not just what judicial uh, developments there are, but recently what legislative developments there are. And so uh, I would, uh, take, based on your question, um, I'm now inspired to send to the Chief Justice some of these recent issues of the Harvard Law Review, and I'm sure that he will find something of use. Good, good afternoon. Um, my question is back to Brown. It strikes me that the core of that decision was about the deprivation of the right to ed education for the African American children. And in today's world, where every major corporation in this country talks about the value of diversity and the value of inclusion, and cities like Cleveland are reaching out to attract immigrants, and that so there's, there's in our society, I think, more of a, a value placed on diversity and inclusion for white people as well as for African American people and other people of color. So I wonder if you think that will have an impact on judicial decisions in the future? So I welcome the question. I think it's very well put. Uh, and in fact, uh, when the question of the use of affirmative action in uh, admissions to uh, law school was presented to the Supreme Court, the most important uh, briefs before the court, friends of the court briefs, were brought by corporate America and by the military, both of which uh, spoke in one voice about the significance of diversity to the quality of leadership and the quality of the work of both corporate America and the military. So that's well understood in many sectors, and it certainly influenced the court. Uh, Justice O'Connor has made explicit reference to those briefs. Whether um, the use of race conscious uh, school assignment will ever be approved in K through 12 education again, I'm more dubious about that. The court again has refused to even allow small uses for purposes of voluntary uh, desegregation. In my view, the central question is whether the um, people who are designing school programs will actually take advantage of school choice options in order to try to promote integration and diversity. So will there be the design of programs that are calculated to try to produce that kind of integration? One area that I did not spend time on, so I will use your question as an excuse to do so, is the relationship between race and then socioeconomic status. So inspired by Brown, many lawsuits were brought to challenge unequal education for students who are poor or live in poor districts. And the Supreme Court of the United States said there is no special scrutiny that will be accorded uh, to poverty uh, or low income. Ironically, while that was a setback for people who wanted to copy Brown in a direct way, it has allowed school districts now to assign students based on socioeconomic status in order to produce integration on those lines. This may be the most promising frontier for the kind of diversity that you're describing. 
Uh, and uh, Berkeley, California, for example, does this and was recently challenged in court, and the court rejected the challenge and said this is absolutely permissible. Um, it, it might even be a way to overcome that boundary between cities and suburban areas. Um, so I think that uh, diversity has many, many faces. You make the reference to immigration. Obviously, we're living through the, the highest period of immigration in this country since the year 1900. Um, the changing face of, uh, of America, I think, calls for drawing on our great strengths as a place of integration, as a place where anybody can make it, as a place where uh, the variety of our population has been our strength. And I think it is a challenge to our schooling system to, t to make that a, a strength as opposed to an obstacle. Uh, dean, the uh, Harvard Law School, of which you are the dean, has had an enviable record over many, many generations of training its students for all the aspects of the law, a common law, a statutory law, uh, administrative law. Uh, the law is determined by the courts. Uh, and my question is, to what extent uh, do you try in your curriculum in addition to these technical aspects of the law, the nuts and bolts of the law, to also include the values of the law, uh, an issue that's very important today when the very same uh, provision of the United States Constitution invariably has a five to four division among Supreme Court justices. Very important question, and in some ways it's uh, almost the flip side of the very first question, because the 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 tension that I hope is a creative tension in law schools is how to actually hold on in one direction to theories, to values, to big aspirations, and in the other direction to hold on to the actual nuts and bolts of practice. I think that that's a creative tension. It is certainly a central mission, not only of our law school, but every, every law school that I know, to address uh, the values of the law as well as the values of lawyers including ethics and what does it mean to actually represent uh, client interests. Um, I do think that our recent economic disaster traces no small part of its origin to a kind of tunnel vision of highly educated professionals who were thinking only about the aspect of a problem right before them and not connecting the dots. And that is, therefore, one reason why, in my school, I have made it a point to ensure that every student has a course in problem solving, where they think about constructive solutions and the effects of their recommendations on real people, as well as courses on international law, comparative law, where the central issue is, do we have to do it the way we now do it, or could we do it differently? So the issue about what are the purposes of law is something that is core to legal education. Because one thing we know for sure, the law will change during the lifetime of our students. The law may change by the time the students graduate. So unless we're teaching about values, we're not actually doing what we ought to be doing. So I welcome the question. Hello, Dane. To your right, how are you today? Welcome to Cleveland. Thank you. I was wondering if you could put some historical context to your book and the reason Brown was necessary. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, the civil rights cases decided after that that kind of negated uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, how do they figure into the historical perspective leading up to Brown sure. and your comments on Plessy and Dred Scott? Well, an incredibly important uh, question. You know, after all, this country fought a very, very bloody costly war around the issue of slavery and the uh, the Confederate States could not rejoin uh, the Union unless they uh, accepted uh, the amendments to the Constitution which one would have thought would have ended the question and yet as we know that's just not true uh, the 13th Amendment ended slavery it didn't end uh, kinds of uh, peonage labor uh, that, that followed in its wake. Uh, the 14th Amendment, uh, in its drafting, uh, was supposed to assure equal protection of the law, and yet, in its application by the Supreme Court, in the years following uh, its enactment, was whittled down to be narrowed to political rights 
and not including economic uh, opportunity, not including social e equality, and quite specifically not including integration in places like railroad cars and elsewhere. Fascinatingly, you mentioned Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the case that gave us the phrase separate but equal is lawful under the 14th Amendment. Everybody knows, or many people know, that that case arose in the context of a railroad cars, where there were separate cars for uh, black uh, and uh, white. Um, and yet, I can tell you, at the time the case was litigated, people understood it was also about schools. And there's a footnote in the majority opinion to the case of Roberts, which came up in Massachusetts, where there was a challenge to segregated schools and where the state court approved segregated schools. Everybody knew that seg uh, segregation of schools was at issue uh, at that time. Look, this has been a story of advance and retrenchment in this country. Um, that's why I think the story of Brown is so crucial, because the lead up to Brown and its consequence involved social movements, hearts and mind, people gathering, not just declarations of, of judges. And changing a society requires more than a piece of paper, it requires more than an Emancipation Proclamation. Um, I do think that the um, more recent history that I describe um, actually starts to vindicate the promise of the 14th Amendment, which was cut back during the period of Reconstruction to which you allude. Um, but it's an ongoing challenge. And if there is a, uh, an encouraging message uh, that I can give out of what sometimes feels like discouraging data, it is this, that the language of equal protection of the laws, guarantee of due process of the laws, whatever was the intention or in the minds of the people who drafted it, has provided a touchstone for the dreams and hopes of successive generations to build an ever-expanding vision of who's included in this circle of care, who's included in this circle of equality, who are the people. And uh, the story that I have to tell is with a combination of uh, social movements and inspired leadership, uh, courageous judges, active legislators, the, re the vision of the Equal Protection Clause, I think, can be realized. Dean, my question relates to the, what you said earlier about immigration. <clears throat> There's tremendous movement going on in the state of Oklahoma, Tennessee, and others, and even in France, to have laws enacted against Muslims. Yes. Uh, I'd like to have your thoughts on it. Yes. I was recently in France, and uh, it is a, a very surprising experience to talk with people who just very you know, easily say, well, of course, no one should be allowed to be in public wearing uh, headgear that they believe is religiously mandated. It's just something I wouldn't hear, at least in where I live in the United States. Th there is a real danger of what some people have called Islamophobia, right? Um, and we have seen this happen in this country in other contexts where, particularly when you're going through a period of economic dislocation, the attribution to a group of people of um, the problems that others are experiencing is something that's just easy and familiar. And it's why leaders and civic fora like this are so important to challenge any kind of stereotypes, any kind of assumptions that uh, particularly economic dislocation is the cause of any particular group of people. I, I believe and I hope that there's a wellspring of commitment in this country to protect both religious freedom and uh, equal protection of law um, that will be a guard against some of the challenges that we've seen, uh, both in this country, but especially sweeping Europe. There is a kind of panic sweeping Europe. Um, and I think we have a different story. One reason we have a different story is that we have been an open society. We've been a society where, despite bad histories of exclusion, stereotypes, people can make it economically. And there can be a uh, call upon the ideals of the nation, even when they're not always lived up to in practice, for inclusion. And that has meant, just take the city of Detroit, Detroit um, has uh, in its uh, Islamic uh, population a higher standard of living, higher educational level, level than it does for the rest of the population. That tells us that it's possible to succeed in America, and it's a different path for dealing with um, and, uh, and welcoming immigrants than we're seeing in some other parts of the world. Good afternoon. <clears throat> my, 
My name is Joseph Meisner, and I'm the secretary of our class of 66, uh, which we think to be the greatest class Harvard ever had. <laughs> but I want to tell you, in our class, when we started in 63, we had 550 students, 25 were female, 525 were male, and we had three students who were Afro-American. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the progress of Brown, both at Harvard as well as at other law schools and postgraduate schools in the U.S. Well, it, it's a great uh, question, and of course you were the greatest class along with all the other great classes. <laughs> That's a dean speaking, right? Um, reminds me of the grandmother who said to one grandchild, you are my favorite Susan grandchild. <laughs> Um, so, so the Harvard Law School has come a long way, baby. I am the second female dean. When I joined the faculty uh, 30 years ago, there were two women on the faculty, and I couldn't find the ladies' room. Uh, it's become a, a place that I think is um, completely inclusive on gender grounds. We're 48% uh, female students. Nationwide, uh, women are a majority of students in law schools. It's about 52% nationwide, which is um, reflective of what's happened in undergraduate education. Actually, undergraduate education is getting closer to 55, 56% female. Um, we have to now worry a little bit about the men. Where are they? Um, in terms of African-American enrollment, I can tell you that we're about 12% African-American enrollment. In terms of um, students of color, we're 20% students of color, about that last year. Um, I imagine that that will only grow as the society grows more diverse. One of the things that's been a thrill for me, having the chance not to sit on our admissions committee, but to look over their shoulder, is just to see these phenomenal applications. Top student from Topeka, Kansas, I'm picking because of its association with Brown, from Vietnam. Top student from Louisiana, you know, from the Sudan. This is a, an extraordinary country that opens up these opportunities for people, and we are eager to welcome them, not only at Harvard Law School, any law school, um, and to watch them become part of uh, leading this country, which is what lawyers can, uh, can do. I had the great privilege of having the President of the United States as one of my students, um, and yes, he was an excellent student. <laughs> um, in fact, he was one of only two students I've ever had in class who had the following quality. When he spoke in class, there was a hush in the class and the students took notes. This isn't true when most students speak in class. The other one, in case you're curious, was a Jesuit priest. What I want to say is when Barack Obama became the president of the Harvard Law Review, that ended yet another barrier. Uh, inside the Harvard Law Review. And uh, we have since had uh, uh, people who are from many, many different backgrounds in leadership roles inside the law school as we do in the country. Hello, um, uh, Dean Minow. Um, one of the legacies of Brown is busing. Yes. And it's particularly poignant here in Cleveland. Uh, it was before my time, but I understand Cleveland at one time had a good school system. And most people in this community would recognize that busing pretty much destroyed what was a good school system and has redounded, in fact, to the detriment of many of the African-American students who remain in the system. So how do you respond to that? And uh, do you think busing should have occurred? Uh, I realize you talked about the fact that there was a Supreme Court case that said you should have busing beyond the right. immediate uh, limits of the school system. But um, I think even if you had expanded busing beyond the immediate school system, the district, uh, people would have found ways to get around it through private schools and other means. But I, I'd be interested in your comments sure. about the legacy of Brown in terms of the remedy that was fashioned and the meaning busing and what you think of it. I'm not an expert on, on Cleveland, and I'd love to hear more from you and others about how uh, things are going here and things are going with the uh, voucher plan and also, uh, I guess, with the mayor's new ideas about charters. What I can say is this. Busing has become a shorthand for uh, many things, and it's unclear what people mean by it. Before there were court-ordered busing plans to implement desegregation, there were many, many students who used a bus to get to school. What changed only was that the focus, on, uh, focus for busing was to produce uh, a, a racial balance in the student population. At the time of the big fights in Boston, I was in graduate school studying the fights over busing in Boston. And what I found was the uh, presence of busing led white families to leave the system. 
they either left the city to go to the suburbs or they left the public schools to go to the private schools. And I think that that is a, a, a taste of what happened largely around the country. I think in terms of the quality of uh, public urban education, I would be hesitant to attribute its decline to any particular cause. Um, certainly the changing um, uh, disengagement of many families from public urban schools is one factor. Frankly, ironically, the opening up of career opportunities for women all, other than being a school teacher contributed to the decline of the quality of urban public schools. Um, many, many factors. Um, I, I, I guess I think that the growth of uh, impoverished communities in urban areas like Cleveland um, has a lot to do with the challenges that the schools face. Um, when schools then have uh, such a large percentage of students who are not just poor but maybe homeless, whose parents are facing just terrific challenges, many poor students who end up being the caretaker for their younger siblings, um, who may not have enough to eat, the challenges that the schools face are far more complex, frankly, than the challenges of schools where the composition of the student body is middle class or upper middle class. So I would be hesitant to trace any problems uh, in Cleveland or anywhere else to a particular use of a transportation device. In the South, busing decreased after school desegregation because busing was used to transport white, uh, black kids out of their neighborhoods to the school that was assigned to the black community. So busing itself is not the problem. There are much more complicated issues about disengagement and disinvestment in the mission of public schools. Uh, and here's another reason why ensuring a diverse student body in the public schools is so important. It's when you have families of many different backgrounds committed to the project that we can count on uh, its success. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a Friday Forum featuring Martha Minow, Dean of the Harvard Law School. Thank you, Dean Minow. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.